Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's Michael. It's Sunday morning. Hope you had a good week. Hope you have a good week to come. We are going to chat for a few minutes about some things that uh, happened this week and lessons we can draw from them. In particular, have a look at these things from a, a presentation point of view. What can we do to improve our presentations? Hey, Stan. <clears throat> good morning. Long time no see, man. Let's see. Uh, Iowa CPA Association back in the day, yeah? We uh, go through life, we have tons of opportunities and things that avail themselves to us that they make life interesting. And sometimes we grab that thing right away. Sometimes we put off the experience for various reasons. Sometimes we put it off because we, it's inconvenient time for us or we're not in the mood or you want to do it with somebody special. And all of those are, I think, legitimate reasons. But... Um, I think there are plenty of other times where we should just go for it, man. There's an old saying, carpe diem, which means seize the day. You know, just do it. Don't wait for a better time, another opportunity. You know, uh, I had a chance to see Frank Sinatra perform live back in the day, and I declined. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. It was my one and only chance. And I wasn't really doing anything that important. But I said, no, thank you, and missed it. Missed my only chance to see Frank Sinatra perform live. If you're not a Frank Sinatra fan, you can't feel my pain, but <laughs> if you are, I mean, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, right? By the way, I just got back from the gym, which is why I look like hell, but that doesn't mean we, we can't have a friendly chat and, and talk about some things. Um, there was a tragic... Um, uh, situation this week in Paris, France, the Notre Dame the Cathedral burned. This is, it was an 800 year old edifice. It took 200 years just to build and it was uh, all but destroyed, at least the cathedral part of it, the, uh, the bell tower and so on, destroyed in less than an hour as a fire raged through it. I hadn't heard that anybody's been hurt, which is always my number one question, right? but the building sure was, and it'll never be the same again. If you had been putting off your visit to the Notre Dame Cathedral for some reason, if you thought that uh, you'd get there another time and enjoy it, if uh, a trip to Paris, France had not been on uh, number one on your bucket list, you know, it was number three, so you had to do the other two first, you missed your chance to see the great Notre Dame Cathedral which I was lucky enough to see many, many years ago on a trip there. We saw all of the great Paris attractions, the Eiffel Tower and the Champs-Élysées and all of that. But um, I just got lucky, I guess, you know, I, or maybe I, maybe I just took action. I, I, when I have a trip, a plan, um, an invitation to go on a trip. I just say, yes, I don't debate it. I don't think about, I mean, I, I try not to think about stuff like whether or not I can afford it. I never want to go into hock on these things, but I try to make sure I have enough money to go on the, you know, these special invitations, these special trips. I don't want to say no. I always want to say yes. And because when we say no to stuff, it, it, it impacts us later. And I think the life lesson there, if you're going to seize the day in something, is this idea of just grabbing it, man, making it happen. We talk about this in sales training a lot in the Present Like a Pro course, the online course, because uh, think about this. If you're a salesperson and you meet with a prospect and the prospect decides not to do business with you, um, they don't say no forever. They say, I want to think about it, or they say, uh, not right now, or can you call on me again in a month, right? If you think about this, think of, that's called the sales cycle, right? 30 days, 60 days sometimes six months, sometimes a year before you can close, sometimes never. But that period of time on average that it takes you to close a deal, six, eight, 12 months, is called a sales cycle or a selling cycle. And the, an important question to ask yourself is, after that initial presentation, that gap you know, between the initial presentation and when they finally do buy from you, what changed? If they were truly qualified to purchase from you when you gave the presentation, and please tell me you're only presenting to people who are qualified to buy. What changed in that period of time? Was it 
you as a person? No. Did you become smarter? Maybe a little bit. But you're basically the same person that you were the first time you presented. So what changed in that six month period between when they said no thank you and when they decided to do business with you? Was it their attitude about seizing the day? I don't know. <clears throat> but one theory I have is that it took you that long to figure out a formula for them to be comfortable enough with the situation to seize the day and go for it. You know, something about you in that first session. What do they say in sales? People should know, like, and trust you, right? And if you don't believe in cliches, they should at least be familiar enough with you to, to uh, uh, and be comfortable enough with you to say, yeah, I tr let's do it. Let's do it. But they didn't. They didn't do it for two months. They didn't do it for four months, six months, eight months. That's your average sweet spot for a selling cycle. That's what it is. We're not open-ended on important stuff, people. So I think the life lesson learned from the Notre Dame tragedy is that when you have a chance to do something, when you have a chance to move a relationship forward or take a tour or go on a trip or get out of the house, do it. And, you know, be organized enough. Stephen Covey calls it, you know, quadrant two activity, right? Uh, be in quadrant two, which is when you're working on stuff that's important but not urgent. Many of us are always fighting fire, so always in the urgent quadrant. And if you're in the urgent quadrant, you have to say no to stuff. You can't, you can't, you can't seize the day and seize opportunities. You're too busy seizing the fire that's burning right now in front of you. And so this idea of being able to be ready for opportunities, so when opportunity knocks, man, that you're there to op open the door and, and take advantage of it. And not just for yourself, but for your family or for the, if you're, if you're running a company, you want to take advantage, uh, have the team take advantage of something. But if the company's not ready to do it, you can't. And so I, for me, that's, that's the life lesson from the, the, the tragic Notre Dame fire is that, he should have gone before it burned. And I realize you can't 100% go to everything all the time, you know, but we were putting it off, weren't you? You were putting it off. Okay. Here's something I did this week that I wasn't on my list of things to do ever, <laughs> but I just happened to be in the area. I had a gig at the Indiana University Northwest Business School, uh, which is in Gary, Indiana. Gary, if you don't know, hey, Gerald, how are you? <clears throat> Gary, Indiana is situated almost perfectly between Chicago and Detroit. So we have the Mitten. Does that look right to you? The Mitten. And, uh, and then, and then uh, let's see. So it's on, it's on this side, right? There's a little, there's, there's a Lake Michigan, right? And then there's Chicago on the other side. So Gary's like halfway in the middle. And um, you'd think Gary would be a fantastic place to stop and, you know, there'd be some sort of a, uh, I don't know, attractions there because it's halfway between Detroit and Chicago. Gary is not doing well. Gary hasn't done well in many, many years. It used to be the place I had told, well, a person from Gary told me this, so I don't know if it, I guess it must be true. But he said that at one point, people actually got out of Chicago to go shopping in Gary because Gary was so cool. There's a road in Gary called Broadway. It's, just, it's like Woodward Avenue here in Detroit. It's a main, main thoroughfare. And you could just tell at one point, this six lane or eight lane road was really something. There must've been all kinds of commerce and stuff. I'm told of a resort that was there that people from uh, in Gary, that people went, if they were from Michigan, they went from Illinois, they went from Northern Indiana to go to this resort, but nothing's happening and very little's happening in Gary right now. Indiana University Northwest Business School is happening. And they invited me to do a talk there this week on Thursday, a keynote, leadership keynote, very cool audience, by the way, they had alum, IU alum, they had business people, who, most of which were alumni, and they had a bunch of students there and they put the students at each of the tables. There were probably, I don't know, 125 people at this event. 
And so the students had a chance to chat up the business owners and vice versa. And uh, hopefully what they say is connections are made at this event every year. And it was fun to speak to that kind of a group because there was a nice variety of people and it was fun. So I'm in Gary and uh, the guy that brought me in is an old rotary friend of mine, Ron John uh, Keeney, a great guy. And we grabbed breakfast the morning of the speaking engagement, which was a lunchtime keynote. And uh, we're just catching up on all kinds of stuff. Ron John's a great guy. He's a professor, an adjunct professor at Indiana University. And uh, at some point during our casual conversation, and this is, you know, this is why it wasn't on my radar to do anything else while I was in Gary. I had come in the night before. This is Murphy's, uh, uh, or Speaking 101, I guess. Did you always come in the night before because <clears throat> you don't know what's going to happen? <laughs> with traffic and weather and, you know, health and all kinds of stuff. You want to get a good night's sleep. So I probably could have done the, you know, three and a half hour drive the morning of the gig, but we're always going the night before. And most meeting planners understand this, so they, they get your hotel room and, and cover it. And so that's what happened. And so I'm at the hotel having breakfast with Ron John. And out of nowhere, he says, what else do you want to do while you're in Gary? And, you know, I'm a pretty direct guy and I use humor a lot. And I was about ready to come out with something like, what do you mean? There, there's nothing to do in Gary, something like that. And I, and I kind of bit my tongue and I self-edited, right? Something I'm learning to do better. And I said, um, I said to Ranjan, uh, well, what, do you, what is there to do? <laughs> Not sure what he was going to come up with. And the very first thing he said would hit me in my brainstem. You know, it was one of those invitations. Uh, not something I had been putting off, but something I would be predisposed to saying yes to if anybody ever asked me, you know, would you like to go see Michael Jackson's Boyhood Home? Or in this case, I think what he actually said was the Jackson's Boyhood Home. And for those of you that know me and my background, I too played in a sibling band. I played in a band with my brothers. Nothing near on the level of the Jacksons. Oh my gosh, they were at the top of the triangle for decades in terms of entertainment value. And then Michael has a solo career. Uh, but the four Caruso brothers uh, toured the country in a pop band and we opened for acts like Rick Springfield and Corey Hart, Joan Jett, and UB40. I don't know how we got that gig. And if you haven't been in a band with your brothers, you can't be in this club, right? It's a very special club. Being in a band by itself is a pretty cool experience for, for you and your mates. But if you do it with your brothers, with your family, it's a very unusual space. You know, I think about the Van Halen brothers. Hey, John Carter, good morning. Or you think about um, uh, the Doobie brothers. Wait, there were no, there were no brothers in that band. The Osmonds, of course, man, we tracked them like crazy. We felt like we had a lot more in common with the Osmonds for various reasons, but we've tracked the Jackson Five, you know, forever. We couldn't really borrow much from them. They were super talented, really good dancers, really good singers. They were on the Motown label. They recorded at um, on West Grand Boulevard here at, at the Motown house. It's a house, actually. You can do a tour now at the studio. It's uh, 15 minutes from here, maybe 20. And I thought about that, you know, as we're on our way over to the Jackson family home in Gary, that how that must have happened. You know, Diana Ross has always taken credit for discovering the Jacksons. Who knows? I, I don't know if that's true or not, but she says she did. And, um, and I say that not to disparage Diana Ross, but uh, when you're coming up in the music business, all kinds of people will lay claim to you, you know, just because they said something to somebody else about you, they say, well, I discovered him. You know, I, I, I started talking about him first. And the fact is a lot of people were talking about the Jacksons when it was time to be discovered. But Diane, it makes sense that Diana Ross would have introduced him to Barry Gordy because she was a lead singer of the Supremes. The Supremes recorded for Motown. Barry Gordy checks out the Jackson singers. I don't even know if they were called the Jackson Five at that time and probably says something to them like, We've got to get you into the studio and get you recorded. I want re to record you on my Motown label. We record on West Grand Boulevard. 
here's the address, here's how you get here. There was no map quest, there was no GPS back then, you know, no Google Maps. He would say, you just find the I-94 expressway, same expressway that I drove to get to Gary, same expressway that I drove home. And so all of this stuff is in my brainstem. It's as Ron John casually mentions over a cup of coffee, would you like to go see the Jackson family home? So I went home from the back to the hotel room from the breakfast because I'm, I'm packing. I'm going to leave my hotel room and go right to, you know, to the gig. And then from there, either go home or go see Michael Jackson's house. This is how my day had shifted because I said, yes, seize the moment. I have lots of stuff to do it when I get home. It's a long drive home. I got to tank the afternoon anyway. Stayed an extra hour in Gary, Indiana, of all places. I jumped in the car with Ron John after the gig, and we drove uh, into uh, the, this rather um, desolate neighborhood. There were houses and people living there. It reminded me of, of many parts of Detroit, which, by the way, has made a huge comeback. Gary would love to be Detroit, Michigan right now, because Gary, uh, Detroit has seen a huge resurgence. I tell people when I'm traveling that Detroit is probably the most successful urban renewal success story in the history of civilization. And I'm not exaggerating. And we're probably only half done. But it's been a stunning turnaround, thanks to Dan Gilbert and Bedrock a Real Estate Company and all of the people that have moved their businesses downtown. Dan Gilbert's been offering everybody that goes downtown, every business, rent free for one year. This is a huge carrot. I don't know if the deal is still good anymore, actually. But that's, that's how we lured a lot of people downtown. And so uh, a lot of people had taken their businesses downtown and, and getting ready to make it happen. I'm not sure that would work in Detroit or in Gary. You, you have to have critical mass to get this to work. And I'm not sure they have anything close to critical mass in Gary. So we drove through this rather desolate downtown area, and then we turn on... Um, I think it's 23rd Street or something like this, recently been or renamed at some point, uh, Jackson Family Street or Jackson Family Drive or something. And you just go into this rather ramshackle community. Some of the houses are occupied, many don't seem to be. And you pull up to this um, corner. Uh, it's, it's, it's one block away from a fairly serious high school with a track and an, an outdoor uh, football field and that sort of thing. And uh, there's a black wrought iron fence around two houses, not one. The Jackson family lived in on the corner. And by the way, there's a video of this on YouTube if you want to uh, search it. Go to my, just go to YouTube or my YouTube channel and search Michael, Michael Angelo Caruso Jackson. And it'll come up and I've got the camera and you can see the house in the background. There's also a, a video in the channel of my uh, excerpt of my talk at Indiana University. Uh, and if you search Michelangelo Caruso, Indiana University, that video will come up. So I'm holding the camera, just doing a little low, low Flintstone uh, version of my, uh, you know, on the street reporting. And there's a little placard in front on this wrought iron fence where everybody that comes from all over the world signs it. They probably paint over the damn thing every two weeks to make room for other people to sign. They're, they're signing the wrought iron fence in various ways. Some apparently bring their own paint. They sign the one way, there's a, there's a sign, traffic sign, stop, you know, the, the street sign, people signing that. And by the way, they paint over the wrought iron fence every month or so too. You can tell because there's all kinds of paint spatters on the pavement. So somebody's trying to keep the place up. There used to be a memorial there, a Michael Jackson memorial, but it got damaged. And I know this because there are other videos of people visiting the Michael Jackson family home. There's this little statue of a boy playing with a girl. And Ron John said, that, yeah, that's supposed to be Michael and his sister Janet. And I said, I don't think so, man. Those statues are of white people. <laughs> So I don't know where the statue came from, but it is not reminiscent of Michael and of little Janet at all. The windows of the house are boarded up 
and the house has been closed for some time. You can't go in it. I'm told that the second house next to it, uh, there was a caretaker there for a while or somebody lived there. And I don't know if this is true. Somebody lived there. Uh, maybe somebody else would have to, you know, that, that would have to be like a spacer between the Jackson home and the third house, which is actually has somebody living in it. So th this little street gets tons of traffic. I'm told you don't go there at night, but I, I'm told that this, the place gets tons of traffic. And people want to see that, that, you know, the place where the Jackson family grew up. Now, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you two things. I want to tell you the reason I went, or I, I, you know why I went. My, I had this connection to the Jackson family singers, right, and sibling band and all this stuff. I want to tell you what I came away with, which I didn't think I was going to come away with. And then I want to tell you like the bittersweetness of it, right? So what I came away with was this idea that everybody comes from someplace. You know, every famous person, every celebrity, every person, every person you consider to be famous came from someplace. And a lot of times those places are humble beginnings. And it's hard for us to imagine how humble because we only know that person as a famous celebrity. We only know that person as rich and famous by definition. But when you looked at this little house where Joe Jackson, I forget the mother's name, Joe and Mrs. Jackson raised nine children. It's, it's amazing that these people made anything of themselves, that, that they rose to the top of the pyramid in the, in, the, in the entertainment, the musical entertainment industry. Just amazing to stand there for a minute and think about that. And the human potential that every one of us has, that you have right now. You don't have to be poor to be more successful than you are right now, right? You don't have to be miserable to be happier than you are right now, right? None of us do. Now, the Caruso brood, our family home was in a place called Melvindale, Michigan, which is a, a suburb of Detroit, not very affluent suburb. And my dad upgraded this when I was in second grade, and I'm the eldest of four boys. When I was in the second grade, we moved to a rather upscale city called Trenton, Michigan, uh, much probably 40, 45 minutes away from Detroit. And my dad changed our trajectory, you know, as a family, I'm sure, by relocating us from Melvindale. Thanks for all the love, everybody. Appreciate it. Um, Gerald says, often the background story of coming up is greater than the unknown. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. I and mean, more valuable. You know, like who could relate to Michael Jackson? Who could relate to the Jackson Five after they had become famous? You just relate to their music. You don't really relate to the people. You think you do. But it's what happened in that tiny little home. You can see it in the video. What's what happened in that tiny little home that was the seeds of greatness, right? That's, that's where, that's where the, these, this family pulled themselves up by the bootstraps, jumped on I-94 until they started flying to Detroit and drove three, that same three and a half hour drive that I did to go see Barry Gordy and record, I Want You Back, ABC, right? So that's the first thing I came away with that was, I didn't expect to, which is just, that everybody comes from some place and you can, you can rise above anything, man, right? It was uh, uh, Victor Frankel, it's Victor with a K, who wrote the book, Man's Search for Meaning. And Frankel, Dr. Frankel, to you and me now, became a, a psychotherapist, a psychologist. And uh, he said, you know, because he survived the Nazi concentration camps. And he said, man, you, if I could survive that, you can survive anything. And that's the secret of life, is getting up from being down. You know, it's not hard to have a good day if you have a lot of money and you're happily you know, you have happy relationships with your family, you know, and you live in a great place, right? It's not nearly as hard to do it. But to be able to get up when you're down, uh, Frankel said to cope with the depths of misery. And I don't know that the Jackson family experienced misery, 
but it sure did look crowded in that little house. The second thing that I took away, it was much more disturbing, and that is, of course, now we know a lot more about the Jackson family, Michael Jackson in particular. I recently watched the, well, like the world, I watched when Michael Jackson was all that smack talk about him and children and, and all of the stuff that was uh, in the media. <clears throat> and then I watched him go on trial and be acquitted, I think, on nine counts. Nine counts of doing bad things to kids. Not get, you know, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. Nine times in a court of law. And feeling somewhat better about Michael Jackson and the Jackson family in general, who have defended him, you know, fervently defended him all, the, all this time. Then, like some of you, I watched the leading Neverland's HBO special, which is all the rage right now. And uh, what's fascinating to me is because the movie's pretty well done and these, these people seem to speak with uh, uh, sincerity, you start to think, well, I wonder if the judicial system got it wrong. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a weird thing because Michael Jackson was a boyhood hero of mine. I want to believe the best. And, you know, if, if you believe in our criminal justice system, you can believe, you know, that, that he's not guilty. <clears throat> but what if the justice system got it wrong and he did all these bad things? You know, whether he thought he was harming the kids or not, it's illegal, right? And, uh, and then that's in my head. Now, messing with my, that nice mix I had in my brainstem of, isn't this cool? I'm visiting the Jackson family home. There's this little dagger poke in the back of my head saying, it's not that cool. I don't know what to think. I'm glad I went. I enjoyed the experience bittersweet. I photograph stuff like that when I can because I realize a lot of people don't get to Gary, Indiana. It's not real high on the tourist, uh, that, you know, top tourist destinations in the world. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that high on the top tourist destinations in Indiana, Gary, Indiana. But I'm glad I went and I'm glad I'm able to uh, show some photos and video wow. about it. Um, if you're in this present like a pro group and you're documenting your talks, trying to get more presentations, uh, I experienced something at Indiana University that reminded me that we have to be really, really careful when we're trying to get photos of ourselves speaking for various reasons. I had uh, an interesting situation. I was taking care of business and doing a lot of other things prior to my talk. And I'd actually taken the microphone from my host at the luncheon. Everybody had already eaten now, it's time to do the keynote. And she says, Michelangelo Caruso, everybody applauds. I go up and I realize, oh crap, I didn't give my camera to anybody. I normally do this. I normally take my iPhone, I turn off the uh, screensaver so that it stays lit. And I give it to somebody and I tell them the code to open my phone, right, in case it accidentally closes on them. And, um, and then I give them specific instructions on the types of photographs that I'd like taken. And mind you, I have enough photographs of myself. I have tons of myself, uh, pics of myself speaking. But there may be something in the room that I'm going to position as a backdrop. Maybe they've got a cool uh, slideshow going or a cool sign. You know, speaking at Indiana University was a nice get, right, uh, for me. And so if I can get me in the frame with Indiana University, that's going to be pretty cool. Um, and then, and I'm going to play with the audience like I always do. So I want to get photos of the audience having fun. That's, that's like golden for me. That's, that's, that's Nobel Prize stuff for me, right? I don't need more pictures of myself holding a microphone. But if I'm making somebody laugh, uh, even better, I'm making the person I'm talking to, this is my microphone, I'm making somebody I'm talking to laugh and everybody else in the frame is laughing. Oh my gosh, that's perfect. That makes my day. You could bet I use that photograph. And uh, I had not given those directions to anybody and I had to kind of punt. 
And I said, uh, anybody in the room like to take pictures? Do we have any, anybody in the room majoring in photography, graphic artists, uh, you know, because they had a lot of students in the room. And I eventually got somebody to raise their hand. They knew they were being volunteered for something. And then I handed my camera and I said, would you mind taking some photos and maybe doing a few videos? I'll show you how to do it. And I just incorporated, incorporated it into my uh, speech. It worked out fine on the face of it. And then I saw the pictures. Because I didn't give specific instructions on how to take pictures, I got a lot of stuff I can't use. I got a lot of stuff I have to delete. And you will have the same problem. when. So the reason that we do presentations, number one thing, is we have to serve our audience. That's the number one thing. Number two thing is that it would be great to get a good review from whoever we you know, did the talk for. Even if we never get another speaking engagement from it, if we made the client or the person happy, the person that invited us, that's fantastic. So that's the second thing. Get a good review from the person that asked you. A third thing that I'm always after is another speaking invitation. Now, sometimes that invitation comes from the person that invited me. And often, more often, it comes from other people in the audience who say, this guy's pretty good. I want him to speak to my team or I want him to come speak to my business. This is uh, something that I'm always looking for. Hey, Tracy, welcome. Tracy, I think, is my friend from Edmonton, Canada, eh? How are you doing today, Tracy? Type a comment in for me. Say hi to everybody. Well, it's early in Edmonton. So um, here's how, and Tracy, you'll be interested in this because you, you, you're, a, you're in a leadership position in at least two ways that I can remember. And so when you ask people to take photos of you, you want to specify this way so that you get the photos that you want. Because the person always comes up afterward and said, I, I hope I did good, or take a look and let me know what you think. Right. And you want to be able to say fantastic. Right. So here's what happened. Unfortunately, I did not prep the person that I gave the camera to. And so she for the first little while, she wasn't even getting out of her seat. And she was sitting on the edge of the crowd. So there's 125 people there and I speak in the round. So I'm out working the room. And at times I'm 20 and 40 and 60 feet away from her. And she's still taking pictures from her chair. So how do you think those photos turned out? Like, <laughs> you can't even tell it's me in the photo, right? And um, she doesn't know. She's just doing what I told her to do. I said, would you take some pictures? I didn't say get out of your chair and take pictures, did I? No, stupid ass, right? So um, the second thing that happened was um, she eventually got out of her chair but the way the room was set up, they were round tables. Now, I don't know how much speaking you do, but what's the biggest problem with round tables, everybody? If you, then it doesn't matter if you speak in the round or you're at the podium. If you speak at, uh, at the podium, for example, and the round tables are all filled, <clears throat> that means 33% of the room has their back to you, to the speaker. They have their back to any point in the room. No matter where the photographer stands, 33% of the people will have their back to the camera. That to me is not a good photograph, right? Now, recently I was at a, uh, an event where they did, um, Tracy, it was a Rotary District Conference, and they set it up like a TED Talk, and, and they had the little platform in the round. So no matter where you sat, if you took a picture of the speaker, you were taking a picture of other people. No backs of heads. It was pretty cool, but there's a downside to that, and that is what behavioral psychologists call the resting face, right, or the neutral expression. It's what the expression that most people have, so I don't care how entertaining you are. Uh, if people are watching you speak for 20 or 30 minutes and you took a random photograph of their face, it would look like this, right, because that's that's the resting face of a person just listening. If you made them laugh and you caught them laughing, you know, at that magic moment, it would be a, a good looking photograph. And most photographers, especially amateur photographers that you just handed your camera to right before you started speaking, will not be patient enough to wait for the laugh. They'll just start taking pictures because that's what you told them to do. 
So if you're keeping track at home, when you're trying to get photos, good photos that you can use of your presentation, when you do hand the camera off to people, or you ask them to take photos with their own camera, you want to specify, I'm interested in close-ups or at least medium shots. You may have to explain what a medium shot is, but no long shots. I want expressions. I want happy faces. So wait for them to laugh. You can tell when I'm telling a joke, just wait for that laugh and then snap the photograph. Do you understand? And then like, do you understand? You know, there's a thing called in communication. It's actually used in uh, nuclear warfare. It's called three-peat. You know what a repeat is, right? Repeat is, repeat back what I just said. Oh yeah, you want expressions, all right? But a three-peat is, repeat, I'm going to say it, then you repeat it back to me, and then I'm going to confirm that's exactly what I want. That's a three-peat. I didn't have time to do this before the talk at Indiana University. So this lady's just wandering the room, taking pictures, right? Which is what I asked you to do. She probably took 30 photographs. I had to delete 28 of them. I felt bad, but I can't use them. And then while she's holding the camera, I had her sit. I interrupted my own program to have her sit. This is really hard to do if you're already focused on delivering your content. But I know there was 100 people in the room, and, the, and at least 1,000 are going to see the video, right? So I need a good video. So I said, hey, come on over here. I actually had to send up a smoke signal. She was that far away. Hey, come here. And I said, would you please sit down? I got a chair for her. And then I staged myself, you know, a certain uh, distance from her where the audio wouldn't be compromised because she's using the audio on the phone. You think about all this stuff when you're getting photos of yourself. And I said, I'm going to tell you when I'm going to start. I'm going to start a little segment here and I want you to record it. And then I'll, I'll nod at you when I'm done and you could turn the camera off. I tried not nodding. People can't tell. They just let it go. And then I have to go back and edit it. Right? I hate editing. Let's get it, let's get it right. This, is, this technique is called direct to camera. So I'll gesture, turn it on, and then I'll tell the story. It's two minutes, and then I go like that, you know, and then hopefully she shuts it off. She didn't. It's on YouTube. Indiana University, Michelangelo Caruso, you could search it. And you could say, I, I actually say to her, thank you very much. <laughs> and the camera keeps rolling, you know. My fault. It's my fault because I'm an idiot. I didn't, I didn't make time for it. But it's my only video of that, you know, and it's a good video. It's got good content. That video in particular talks about the fire at Notre Dame and how we need to seize the day and how you can use that, that method of seizing the day to speed up relationships, to get more speaking engagements or speaking invitations, right? And, uh, and this is on, was on my mind today, this heady mix of content and loosely related topics. We were also going to do a, a segment of AMA today, which is uh, on most people's videos, it's called Ask Me Anything. On my videos, it's called Ask Michael Anything. So I'm happy to answer any questions about speaking, presenting, my ambivalence about Michael Jackson. Uh, where what it was like to visit paris in case you've never been any of this stuff by the way even when i hand the camera to people just to take my picture if i'm speaking i know you probably have experienced this but if i'm speaking the camera does like a freeze frame of whatever's happening so this is a, like a director's thing right is that like a rectangle <laughs> or a square see so the camera uh, grabs a snapshot of whatever expression I have in my face at that time. Now watch what happens when I see that. <laughs> it's not very attractive. It's not very attractive when I freeze, right? When I'm just. So what I do, if it, like, there was a good photographer there, and I'm gonna chase him down because I got to find out where he put his photos. He's the good photographer in the room, the professional. And in those pictures are going someplace. And I almost always have to go chase this guy down. His, this guy at the Indiana University, his name was Tomei. And, uh, and I got to find him. So if I can find the photos, then I go through his photos. And those become often the, the photos that become like the, the, the landmark or the bookmark for me for that, to mark that presentation. So I was trying to make friends with the photographer.
So Tomei was shooting at Indiana University, and even the professional photographer can only work with what you give him. So if you're like one of these frenetic speakers that paces all the time on the stage in like a tennis match, or you're always in motion because you're animated and you want to put on a good show for people, your hands are always going to be blurry like this, right? And with Tomei shooting me, if I have the presence of mind to do this, and I did it at IU, I'll say, I got the microphone in one hand, and I go, action shot, and I pose. And he just starts clicking like I'm, you know, Cindy Crawford or some model, Kate Moss. <laughs> and the people in the audience are digging it, so now they're smiling. And then I finally get that photo of this, this kind of animated, uh, complimentary photo of me and everybody in the audience looking like they're having a good time. So that's, that's the art of getting good pictures when you present. It is not easy. And now that we have Facebook and people just dumping their whole SIM card to a Facebook album and they post it all, you know, and this is your image at stake. So you want to manage it to whatever extent that you can. I think it's important. Gerald Valley is in my Present Like a Pro class. I can't tell uh, in this thread, in this timeline, who's still in the program. Uh, Gerald's asking uh, uh, who's still on the video, but I think Gerald still might be. How long did I speak in Indiana? It was just a 30-minute keynote, Gerald, uh, as part of a classic uh, keynote luncheon. So what they do is the rolling start, right? People coming in, getting, our, not cocktails, but cocktails if it's dinner, but getting something to drink, getting finding their seat, 125 people, maybe it's assigned seating, and I guess it was at this event. So finding their seat, introducing themselves, themselves to their tent top, sitting down. This dinner was served um, family style, so they brought the uh, words plated, I guess, plated to the, uh, to the table. Um, and then the host gets up and makes some announcements. They often have one other person speak. In this case, it was my friend Ron John, Professor Ron John. And then the host uh, came back up again and introduced yours truly. So then I did 30 minutes. She came up, thanked me, gave me a bag of swag, which is posted on a pretty good bag of swag, by the way, photo on my Facebook page. And, um, and then uh, back to work, everybody, back to school. So about an hour and a half, sometimes an hour and 45 minutes, but that's the typical, the typical keynote at a dinner, at a meal of some kind, is 20 to 30 minutes. And the reason is uh, people's kidneys uh, will cut you short. It's time to go to the bathroom, right? They can, time to, or time to go back to work if it's a midday thing. And that's, that's the way it works. So thanks for your question, Gerald. Gerald is uh, just now starting the Present Like a Pro online coaching course. And he's, uh, his comments so far have been very favorable. He's an extremely sponge-like man. This guy is ready to take it all in. Uh, and he meets the three ingredients that I look for when I'm bringing, you have to be enrolled into the course. You just can't, you just can't give your credit card and you're in. You have to be invited in by me. And I look for three things to bring you into the course. You have to be coachable. You have to be decisive. And you have to be resourceful. And here's why. You have to be coachable because I don't want you to be arguing with me. You're paying me for my expertise. Uh, like one gentleman that just graduated is getting ready to be president of his national association. And they're going to put him on the road to go speak at all the state associations. And he wants to, he wants to crush it. And so uh, I said, great, I'm going to help you, but are you coachable? I made him tell me he's coachable. I can't prove it. I just have to take him at his word because it, I don't want you to get into the class. It's only six weeks and argue with me <laughs> about what to do. I need you to be coachable. Are you coachable? He says, yes. Um, I also ask that you be resourceful because I'll tell you how to build your brand or build your channel or. Uh, practice using video and I'm not coming over to your house to show you how to use your iPhone unless you live in Gary Indiana then I'll come to your house <laughs> apparently so you have to be resourceful enough to figure out how to use your own iPhone we had a guy in my course a while back who uh, didn't really know how to by his own admission he didn't really know how to use email 
Oops. You have to be resourceful to be to be successful in anything, especially in my course, right? And the third thing is you have to be decisive. You have to be able to seize the day. You have to say, yes, I want it. And, I'm, and I don't kind of want it. I want it badly. Specifically, I want it now, right? And then we're fit. Because if you waffle, if you only kind of want to be an elite speaker, if you only want to kind of want to care about your image, we're not a fit. If you only need tips on speaking, Google it. I don't do information, I do transformation. And I will transform you if you are coachable, resourceful, and decisive. That's how it works. So that's my promise to you. And Gerald's gonna kick it, man. I'm gonna make sure of that. No other questions today, guys. If not, I will, uh, I will say uh, go out and get, uh, get some vitamin D. John Barrico, how are you, man? John, uh, I think John's East Coast, I'm trying to remember. And he does a lot of work in the media and in, in uh, imaging. Thanks for the compliment, John, about the photo tips. I appreciate that. That's true, man. I mean, we, we, uh, it's just weird the way we treat our own image. You know, I just think we should be more, have more self-respect, people. <laughs> so before I sign off, um, a couple things I'm looking forward to, and if you've got something you're looking forward to, you want to put it in the comment section, we'll all wish you luck. We're all here to support each other. Uh, I am on my way to Birmingham, Alabama uh, next weekend to speak at a leadership conference. Can't wait. And it's race weekend down there, which should be interesting. I'm told that our hotel will have a cast of characters, a NASCAR, NASCAR race. I'm not a fan, but I'm, I'm told... Uh, Told them we're going to meet some crazy people. Shortly after that, Renee and I are going to Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon, to speak at a leadership conference there. It's my second time to Beirut, and uh, it's a safe place these days, as safe as uh, places can be on a week-to-week -week basis. I was, uh, I was watching the news today about the tragic bombings in Sri Lanka, which happened out of nowhere. Sri Lanka was safe until yesterday. Um, and uh, there has been some uh, violence and bombings and explosions in churches, some sort of a calculated campaign. So we will go to Beirut, Lebanon with our eyes open. And then when we come back from that, I've got a trip to Hamburg, Germany, to the Rotary International Convention, and I look forward to that. So lots of good things, fun things to look forward to. We are onboarding people into the Present Like a Pro program uh, uh, in an ongoing manner, and that's really rewarding for me, super rewarding for the people who graduate. And if you're interested, just message me below. I appreciate you spending some time with me this morning. If you've missed any uh, or a part of this video, you can re uh, watch the whole thing in the timeline. Just click it. And of course, there are other videos in the album. Um, uh, in the uh, video album on this page. Thanks very much for all you do to keep your presentations professional, and we'll talk to you soon. See you, everybody.